bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Ah, now this, this is an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Masters Edition of Right Edge, the Golf Odd Show, coming your way for the very first time on the Bet the Board Podcast Network. Bad news right off the bat. No pain, no Furman to talk some golf with us. Good news. It's not just me, Nick Swatala, but we are going to be joined by Jeff Sherman, the great Sherman, over at the Westgate Superbook, head golf odds maker, VP of risk management for my money, the sharpest golf odds maker out there. The group, really the group at the Superbook doesn't get enough credit old school, sharp risk team. And Jeff's been a part of that going on 20 years now. He's always a terrific spot, always has been dating back to my radio days and and during the soft launch of this Golf Odds podcast. Jeff going to come on for what hopes to be about a 30-minute spot. Everything and everything. I'm talking the handle at the book. I'm talking the Joe money. I'm talking the pro money. I'm talking Jeff's personal liens and personal investments. Always open to dishing those out is Jeff Sherman. So we'll get that on for you. Yes, we'll follow up with an additional pick segment. Yes, for you bet the board nuts. I think I've narrowed it down. We'll get you the best bet. So let's use the next day, day and a half, to carve out what's left as far as opportunities for profit, as well as getting an understanding of where this market is headed, where this market's going to close, and why certain areas are going to close there, uh, whether it's based on certain groups of money or, or certain philosophies as we continue to dissect. So excited to finally carve out a path here on this podcast to get something going in time for major championship season, perhaps to create more of a hard launching opportunity. That has been quite difficult leading up to this point as far as attacking it week to week, whether it's because of the betting, uh, the market information separately, catting at Shadow Creek, the equipment issues at the time, no more, uh, because there I was wondering what the plan would be going forward with this myriad of issues. And then I asked myself, why run a one-man band when I got Coach Franklin sitting in Aiken, South Carolina? Resignation papers submitted since February. All he does is bet. Quite sharp. Good golf better. The Princeton basketball NBA system, we can go without at times. But when it comes to golf, major asset for what we have going as a whole. So, so now that the one-man band is no longer an option, we pull Coach Franklin off the golf course and we put him to work. And with his help... I believe we can attack a key window to unleash some stuff going forward, whether it's getting busy with the major championship season. As far as right edge the golf odd show goes, we're just taking off, and Coach Franklin's going to have a great deal to do with that. So that could set the table for some big things to come as far as what we have going on here. As far as bet the board goes, really excited to get you a little dose of what the major championship strategy entails started off with, with Masters Week. So welcome to the show, and let's get busy. Because I believe we have a spectacular Masters in store. Just because of all the storylines, one of them has to cash in, right? It starts with the Scheffler discussion because of the market alone. He is in unprecedented territory to win major championships. It's one thing when you're playing in Houston two weeks ago. It's another thing to get pounded by extremely sharp batters at 7, 8, and 9 to 1 and end up at a floor of 3 to 1 the week of. I believe for that reason, Scheffler has much to prove here. It sounds crazy coming off of back-to-back wins and nearly three straight wins, but when it comes to justification for this price, when it comes to Tiger Woods pricing, everybody wants to make the comparisons, and I see them. I see them statistically from tee to green, but unfortunately for Scotty Scheffler, in that calendar year span without a win against John Rahm at the Ryder Cup, 17th hole, BMW against Hovland, and from five feet and change in Houston, the putter let him down, despite the new experiment being well on its way with the mallet putter. I don't think it's a shoe in that Scheffler's just going to show up here and putt well. This is not the Houston Open. This is Augusta National, the most complex greens out there. Now, Scheffler's got experience. Scheffler has a green jacket. 
Scheffler won that green jacket going away. He was up five shots. Remember, he four-wiggled on 18. It was actually jaw-dropping. Four-wiggled. Let's see him under pressure this week at this price cash in for his backers. And we're going to hear about it if they cash in because I heard about it for two straight weeks. And those of whom that have followed the show and followed my work and followed my input and, and really my action as a whole. No, I'm down on Scheffler. It starts with the price, and, and that was the case throughout the Ryder Cup, which led to a gross misprice on Team USA as a whole. And that was the case down the stretch in the FedEx and, and that year without cashing in on a, on a tournament win. Remember, everyone's going to let you know when they hit Scheffler 4-1 to one this week. But what they didn't let you know is they actually ain't betting this week because they ran out of bankroll betting Scheffler for an entire year. So when it comes to 4-1, to one, it's just because of the market. I want to see some things in a pressure moment. I've seen Scheffler run away with these tournaments. I've seen Scheffler play three, four groups behind down six and make the great comeback on Sunday and and find out he's winning on the range. I've seen it, and I respect it. Because at the end of the day, if this was offered at seven to one tonight, seven and a half to one tonight, I'm taking it. So there's plenty of respect there. But when it comes to a floor of three to one, and you see some books pop back up to five to one just to get some interest back in there, clearly, right? Has to be the case. I'm not sold. The putter is just going to show up here. With this being his first go at it now in this cycle with the mallet putter, I think he's, I'm not sure he knows what he's in for there. Let's see if he can prove me wrong. Scotty Scheffler at this price to win a golf tournament, to win the Masters, folks. The Masters. A floor of three to one. A consensus of plus 450. And if you want to get involved, if you want to fire one shot and, and forget the rest of the field, the best you can do now is plus 510. With Rom, your defending champion. John Rom has since joined Liv. He is back. I think this is fascinating too. Why? Simple. I have to see how Rom performs while not having too many concerns about his form. Four top tens and five starts on Liv. Has been hitting the driver quite well. Has been hitting his irons quite well. Has the same craft around the greens. He's clearly practiced. He's clearly motivated, right? But this is a different John Rom this year. This is a John Rom that is starting to express serious regret about joining Liv. This is a John Rahm that doesn't like the expectation of getting barked at by fans at tournaments. It's not going to happen at the Masters. There may be one dude out there, but, but for the most part, the Masters is quiet and it's as professional as it gets, as it's described as the cathedral of golf. You're not going to get that at the Masters, but make no mistake, he got it at LVCC, even at a Liv event in Vegas. He's going to get it at the championships, the PGA championship, the Open championship. He's going to get it. And he hates that. And he hates that because he's realizing that he signed up to play golf in a world of irrelevance for years, possibly forever, because there is no merger coming. It's far from imminent. The details are far from being worked out and far from agreed upon. John Rahm and T. Rell Hatton we're sold a completely different story. So now you have John Rahm, an unhappy defending Masters champion, John Rahm, coming back this time around in the same price range, 11 to 12 to 1, about to play with even greater pressure on his shoulders than what was even expected as a, as a defending champ year in and year out because of what's going on with Liv. Because of Rahm now realizing that, that he may have made a huge mistake. He clearly misses the PGA Tour He clearly misses being well-liked and appreciated. That ain't going to be the case tonight at that dinner. That ain't going to be the case throughout the week at Augusta. John Rahm's going to feel it. John Rahm knows it. And now you have this new favorite that leads the live pack. It's not Dustin Johnson. It's not Kepka, who did live big time by, by winning last year. But now that they've beefed up the roster, they need more wins. They need, like a major championship per season, at the very minimum, if you want to take who, at the time, really was the best player in the world in Rom. Remember, it wasn't that long ago um, where, where it sounds silly now, but it was Rom, it was McElroy, and it was Hovland because of those issues that I brought up with Scheffler. That has since changed, clearly. Now, I think we might get something different from Rory, who's right next in line on that list of discussion. It's not Tiger Woods, it's Rory McElroy, who's going for the Grand Slam again. In that range where much of me doesn't have interest, 
other than a couple of specific fades I was targeting. More on that later. McElroy's justifiable there. Other than that, he kind of just is where he is right now. He has yet to bottom out, so the price wasn't really there to capitalize on entering the Valspar last week, or excuse me, the Valero Open last week, where McElroy decided to participate you know, for the first time in a long time, get some golf before the Masters week, change things up a little bit. He's working with Butch Harmon. He's staying in touch with Butch Harmon. Things are going in a positive direction there. I do believe it's fair to ask, considering he missed the cut last year, showing signs of this being, speaking of weight on the shoulders, this is, this is almost too much for Rory. Last year, between trying to be the face of standing up for the PGA Tour, and, and he is the face of the tour. And by the way, he's a wonderful face for the tour. I'm a big fan of Rory McIlroy. Because at the end of the day, he's always been a terrific ambassador for this association. He has. But there was just too much on his plate between this live divide and then trying to chase the Grand Slam. And then he's starting to look at the calendar and say, wait, it's 2024. This is going on 10 years now since Valhalla. 10 years for arguably a a top two, three, four player of all time. 10 years without a major championship. It was starting to weigh on him. Well, now Rory's gone. And it wasn't all by his choice, but he's gone. He's out of that. In fact, he's completely turned, uh, turned the table around on, on his position going forward. He wants the world tour. He wants everything to uh, come together. At least that's what he's saying now. Do I believe he feels like that in the background? Not necessarily because, again, not only, I don't view, not only do I view this thing as, as non-imminent, but, but I'm not so sure this is going to happen at all. Now that the SSG is involved, you wouldn't know it based on the PGA Tour app that they're operating on a week-in and week-out week out basis. But with the SSG involved, Those cats in the SSG, led by Arthur Blank and the Fenway Group, those cats right there, they ain't getting in this to partner up with the Saudis. (laughs) They're in this to to leave a name for themselves and leave a positive mark and say, we're going to prevent the need to go to the Saudis. And those guys that left, well, now they're fucked. That's their idea. And I think that's absolutely in play. And John Rahm knows it. Greg Norman knows it. And Rory McIlroy probably knows it, but he's going to go out there and and try to save some face, rebuild some bridges that he burned. And uh, ultimately, I think that's going to take much of the weight off his shoulders going in. I was not on the right side of McIlroy last week. I needed to see it. I believed it, but I just needed to see it because that market floor just didn't really pop up for me. There there really wasn't legit opportunity in my lens. Um, it wasn't the proper lens to look through because there was heavy professional money on, on McElroy over Ludwig Aber, minus 120, minus 130. That ballooned their icon at Aber plus 130. Well, I didn't get Ludwig Aber on Sunday. I got Dudvig Aber on Sunday. After watching McElroy march his way to a ho-hum 66 on Sunday at the Valero. And now we get Rory five days later. A motivated, what I have to believe internally is an angry Rory McIlroy. That is a storyline. Then next I'll put Tiger Woods. He's officially priced in no man's land at a consensus of 150 to 1, a peak of 175, and then you have your ripoff books that will deal you 100. It's, it's, it's not there anymore for Woods as far as winning this thing outright goes. I need to see make the cut. I need to see get by in these matchups now. The books have caught on. Now, it doesn't mean that there wasn't significant opportunity at the get, at the, from the get-go here on the opportunity to fade Tiger. There seemed to be limited opportunity this time around at the Genesis, especially at books such as a FanDuel that was extremely focused on the expanded menu for Tiger at the Genesis, not this past, but in 2023. More focus on expanding the menu, more the likelihood to make an error. 69 and a half or worse, minus 110. We're not quite getting that anymore, but there's been a big stance taken this week, pro versus Joe as far as Tiger Woods. And it's the same story going forward, and it will continue to remain the same story going forward. Pro on the fade and and the Joe on the, uh, you know, on the make the cut. The buyback against Zach Johnson. Buyback against Bubba Watson. And buyback against the most commonly used matchup out there on the market, Phil Mickelson. Open minus 110 apiece. And of course, that gets up to 30, 35, 40. There's going to be Tiger money there. No doubt about it. We'll touch upon that with Jeff Sherman. I think this Tiger Woods thing, again, I give him no chance to win this thing. Zero. 
Golf Channel, Live at the Masters, they're all waffling between 10 to 15 percent. That's 10 to 15 percent too high for Tiger. We're talking about getting through this thing without a WD. The weather situation, it could be great, it could be terrible for Tiger Woods, just like it can be for both waves of this T-sheet, really three waves, the, the beginning, the mid, and the end. Who knows where this is going to go? It's something to monitor going forward. It's definitely going to be monitored uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, leading up to the Masters. But Tiger Woods, he's a main topic of discussion because he's in a, just a totally different territory now on the market. Zach Johnson, Bubba Watson, a dog to Phil Mickelson, who's you know getting being offered at 350 to 1. That's the discussion. Not whether or not Tiger's winning. That's the discussion. Whether or not he's going to completely bottom out and, and maybe contend to make the cut. And if he does make the cut, can he get through the weekend? That's the Tiger Woods discussion. And as far as Liv goes, I just mentioned, I do think they, they're going to need another win or two this year to attain any credibility whatsoever because now I think they have none uh, despite beefing up their roster. You have to respect the fact that they have gotten players and you have to acknowledge that these PGA Tour fields are, are getting watered down. I don't think I have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with players getting opportunity. I don't have a problem watching Peter Malnati play unbelievable golf on a Sunday minus a shot where which he completely topped it like a 19 handicap would in the middle of the fairway with a fairway medal. Watching that. I have a problem with the tour coverage. I have a problem with the broadcast at times. I have a problem with the app. There's other things I have issues with. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that if Liv wants real credibility, they got to have these guys show up. They did last year. To much surprise, it was Mickelson. It was Patrick Reed, top fives. John Rahm's going to be in the mix for many to, to pick as an outright winner this week. It's not going to be for me. I have too many questions about how this guy is going to handle himself and his play under these circumstances. It's already overwhelming, as I said, as a defending champ. I do not believe John Rahm is very comfortable right now. Liv is going to need him. He's going to need Kepka, maybe DJ. I'm not buying that either, but maybe DJ um, to, to not just contend in this thing, but to win this thing. And as far as the value goes, I don't think there is any. Rom is in the same price range as he was last year, albeit not in great form, but it's just not for me. Kepka was north of 40 last year, and I had a ticket. Sub 20 this year, I know he's a different animal with these major championships. Why bother even consuming and, and, and observing the data whatsoever from the week prior at, at the Trump in, in Miami? But that was horrendous golf. Changing putters, now coming to Augusta. Hey, what applies for Scheffler? Applies for Kepka. New putter from Doral to Augusta. Good luck. That's all I can say. And DJ at 35, no thank you. Why? Because he won at, at Las Vegas Country Club. Cam Smith, mid 30s. Not with the other guys I have available. No thank you. And those long shots, forget about it. So I just don't see the value. It's, it's, there's no bias there. There's never been bias. I just don't see the value. Another great topic of discussion for the great Jeff Sherman, who is joining us next on Right Edge, the Golf Out Show, coming your way on the Bet the Board Podcast Network this time around to jumpstart our 2024 major championship season. This is going to be a doozy, folks. Right Edge, the Golf Odd Show, coming your way, of course, on the Bet the Board Podcast Network. So excited to do that on this Masters Week, Masters Tuesday, in fact. And just as excited to get Jeff Sherman on, as promised, VP of Risk Management at the Superbook. Jeff, I believe, has been at the book going on 20 years. That anniversary has to be coming up. He's been in the industry for 30 years, so I know that anniversary already did come up. Jeffrey, happy Masters Week to you, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Always appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Nick. How about some details about the menu, Jeff? I know by the year it's continuing to expand. It has to lead the league in overall handle as far as the Masters goes now. Yeah, yeah, we're on pace to set a record this year. We've got more betting options up than we've ever had. Uh, a lot of manual work, but uh, we got it all together and some propositions. And, you know, uh, our golf team put it all together. So it's good stuff, and it's been a good reaction so far. I assume the battery has to be winding down, or do you have more to come on the menu tomorrow? No, we have everything up. We did the first round matchups today after the tee times came out. So 
uh, that and the first round lead over the last few things we had to get up there. So now it's a matter of just uh, booking it and, and keeping things where we want. Plenty of big-time storylines, as I opened up with in the monologue. But let's start with the overall landscape of this tournament, Jeff. Now with the weather report coming in, everyone with their eyes on the tee times today. Have to imagine that led to some positions being taken on the matchup menu with the differentiating times. Well, how about this winning score prop? From what I understand, the consensus opener was 11.5. I know you were right there, too. Minus 110 both ways, Jeff. Any action in favor of over or under in light of the news with what could be a nasty Thursday? Yeah, we saw some over support from Sharp Play. So we were at minus 110. Now we're over minus 150 under plus 130. And like you mentioned, it's going to be an interesting twist to this week with the uh, early morning possible delay due to thunderstorms and, you know, affecting some matchups early, late uh, tee times. And we've got people looking at that. So I've, I've got uh, some of the guys in the office looking through that and adjusting some prices on the matchups. Seeing that over juice come in just about all across the board. Um, Tiger, another guy that has to come to mind when it comes to weather, when it comes to p- possibility of extending golf 20, 25 holes in a day. Tiger can't afford that, Jeff. Do you believe the professional fade, market-wide fade, I might add, was in response to that specifically, or do you think was bu- this was building up as far as Tiger matched up with Mickelson, a r- array of options at Bet Online all got smashed, uh, Zach Johnson used at Circa got smashed. How are things at the Superbook with the Tiger liability? Yeah, you know, we saw some early sharp support or anti-Tiger support, and it, it's been going like that for a while. We saw it at Riviera, where they bet against him to make the cut. You know, they had that rare cut in the signature event there, uh, first-round score, and we expected the same thing. So, you know, when we first priced everything, I had the price around pick him for him to make the cut, expected some no support to show up. So I opened it no thirty. immediately got some support, got as high as $1.70 on the no. Now back down to minus 135 is there's some slow moving places in the market that we took some scalps to, but we definitely have more sharp play on the no for Tiger uh, to make the cut. And also on his win, on his first round score, I opened 74 and a half flat, took some play on the under just from arbitragers, but then sharp play back on the over. So uh, not a surprise that people are looking to fade him. He's got the one competitive round under his belt this season, uh, a lot to go off and, you know, still the, the rumors about him having back issues. So it's a lot of things working against him. And now you throw the wrench of the weather in there too. Like you mentioned, likely to play more than 18 holes on Friday. And, you know, it's a tough go for him just to get through 18. It's amazing that this opportunity exists uh, throughout the market, Jeff. I mean, I'm going back, not this past Genesis Invitational, but the year prior where sure he was, you know, a dollar ninety dog to Luke Donald. That stood out. But but there were still some some opportunities to profit, especially with the cut and what has basically turned out to be an expected WD. That's why I put everything aside with Mickelson. I'm not high on Mickelson whatsoever this week, but I backed him at a dollar ten. Every book's using this matchup option. I'm seeing twenty eights, I'm seeing thirties, thirty fives, forties as high as 45, that matchup is offered at the Superbook. Where do you stand now, and do you have a position on that side? Yeah, we're sitting at $1.35 on Mickelson over Tiger, and uh, we we actually have taken a lot of Tiger support in that. So right now the book needs Mickelson, and I did play that one myself. I laid $1.20 on Mickelson just for all the reasons that we went over. It's not a Mickelson thing, that's for sure. Mickelson last year, of course, showed up with no form, somehow cracks second place for the tournament overall. Remember, Jeff, I mean, he lost four strokes at the end of the round three. Who knows what could have happened if he could have just held on after that that weather extended round three into that Sunday. Off went Mickelson in round four. Once again, comes in without form. Uh, Tiger Woods also in the story here. He's being drawn to Scheffler, Jeff, in a multitude of ways. I get the tee to green comparisons, but when we're talking about this outright market now, I still have concerns with Scheffler, whether it's with the putter overall, whether it's in some spots under pressure. Here we are now at a floor of three to one. Some books must have been welcoming some Scheffler money late because I did see Bet Online, I did see the aforementioned Circa, Boyd of all places, did get the plus 510, plus 515. Did you make it there yourself? And did you take position on Scheffler at the right time when he was offered in that, say, eight to nine range? Yeah, and, you know, we're seeing some consistent support on Scheffler. And we're at nine to two. He's number one in ticket count, number one in money wagered. Uh, there's no reason for us to go higher. It's still coming in and holding the position strong. I did play him at eight to one, right as he started to go on his run, winning the first tournament of his consecutive, almost three in a row. 
uh, knowing that it was going to dip. So um, I have a little bit of eight to one, and um, I wouldn't recommend anything short of five to one. I think over five, just the way he's played this year, like you mentioned, his tee to green metrics, uh, you expect him to be there on Sunday. It's so hard to find guys, consistency, and guys that can win. I mean, you talk about consistency. Xander is consistent near the top, but he doesn't get the W. But at least Shuffler gets the W. So if you're looking for that, you have that going for him. So I can't fault anyone for betting him over 5-1. to one. I wouldn't recommend it less than that. You can't. But, okay, if you got one ball at the fire at 5-1, to one, maybe that, uh, at the end of the day, very well could get by instead of, you know, taking four guys, whether it's a Xander before the dip, Hideki before the dip, what have you. Let's go to Xander. I think that was the most noticeable dip I saw in the outright market this week, Jeff. I saw this still camping out at 28, 25, and then 22, and then boom down to the floor of 13. I know it made it to at least 14 on your end. This guy might be a different player now, Jeff. He's grown up. He's not a kid anymore. He made a move, a comfortable move, I might add, from San Diego to Florida. He left his dad behind, which I think is a huge blessing. He finally got somebody that has actual knowledge about the golf swing, and he's in tremendous form. Do you buy the move on Xander? Well, I'll tell you, a couple weeks ago, my golf guy, Neil, uh, he said that power rating wise he has would have xander second rated coming in behind scheffler he played him at 24 to 1 and he preached it for two weeks and said watch the week of you're going to see the reaction in the marketplace on and he was spot on with that and you know the one thing that we talk about in the office is and we've seen it time and time again is you know the tough part is getting that w and he just so many times he lets it slip away and so i understand the move and in relation to that it brings down the top 5, 10, 20 in place pricing, uh, and that has to be accounted for too. And you're going to see it reflective in if you bet those those other markets or relative markets to it. But if I'm recommending something involving Sander, I wouldn't do it at 14 to 1 now. Mm-hmm. You know, 20 or north of that I could have seen taking a flyer on, but I don't have a problem anybody that wants to bet him top 20, top 10 in matchups right now. Um, you know, we've seen him prove how he can come so close and be consistent like that. And you can cash those other ways without maybe missing him, not winning the tournament. I know you opened the Scheffler matchups three ways, both, or I should say all three around the dollar 70 each over Rory over Rom and over Xander, no support on Xander or any of the three for that matter against Scheffler in that 72 hole. Uh, the, the prices have been pretty solid. It's been a little bit of two way, nothing that's caused any movement. Um, we did have a little bit of Scheffler against uh, Rom, mm-hmm. minus 175. We're at minus 180 there. But the other ones, a very minimal movement and, and good two-way right now on those matchups. I did see a big move on that matchup against Rom. If you were to recommend the lay 170 against any of the three, would it be Rom yourself? Uh, it, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend to lay those prices against any of them. I mean, it's just with this course and, you know, things can get away from these guys fast. And I'm not one that looks to lay large prices. I mean, I have to keep things maybe less than a dollar fifty if I'm thinking about getting involved. So it'd be a pass for me, and you know, I couldn't decipher any of them. I mean, it, it's small differences between the, the McRoy, Rom, and, and Xander uh, trio there. Sure. Speaking of Rom, and speaking of the price sensitivity, let's move on to live here. I think they need a win in the worst way, Jeff. Whether it's Rom, uh, whether it's Kepka, whether it's somehow Smith, they need somebody. Uh, from that, if you want to call it an organization, I think that's being generous. But they they need somebody to win now. I don't see the value this time around, uh, Jeff. I mean, I had Kepka ticket last year at 41. Here he is sub 20. I got DJ last year on my notes at 55. He wins a hit and giggle at right down the street from you, LVCC. He hits 30, 35. That doesn't make sense to me. A plethora of these live guys now with the Kep, uh, between Kepka, between DJ, and then you're really not going to go north of that with Neiman. Okay, maybe at 60. Uh, I know that's made some portfolios, but not at 20, not at 25. Do you see any value whatsoever on this live player market, particularly in the outrights? Well, you know, they're really starting to drift because that's the one constant we've seen over the last couple of years is the lack of support in majors for them because they're not, their visibility isn't there. People aren't paying as much attention. They're not getting in, involved with them as much uh, outside of Kepka because everyone knows his focus has always been on the majors anyway, and he's proven that. And he did it last year with the PGA. And, you know, you're saying that uh, you, you think one of these live guys needs to win. Well, Kepka did last year for the PGA. So he that did. did cement something to that effect. But um, now that you added Rom into the mix and strengthened their field, 
you know, I can't discount Neiman yet. You know, 30 to 1 range. He's played fantastic the last few months. He got the invite from the Masters partly because he won on the DP Tour and not the Live Tour, even though he did win on the Live Tour twice since then. But with the three wins and his consistent play, I think he can make some noise. And if I'm looking for somebody from Live, he's the guy I'd still have to stick with. And I did get some 60 and 50 on him as he was winning, you know, a month or so ago. But, uh, you know, that definitely would, would be a play. And I can't fault anyone for putting him in their portfolio in the 30 to one range right now. Cause he's still playing top notch golf. Superb work getting that in before the dip. Cause I know it happened soon after. Um, I'm with you on Neiman. I guess I shouldn't, I spoke too soon. That market, I guess this week, oddly enough, has seemed to drift back down to that 28, 30, 31, 50, uh, that range right there. But, but I did see it at 2022 and, and that, um, there was no appetite whatsoever. I, I did mention Rom Jeff. He didn't come into this event in great form last year. He wasn't putting great. In fact, he didn't putt all that well in the tournament. I think he ranked outside the top 20 in putting on his way to a win. So it's tough to make the argument that there's no value for him in a similar price range. But uh, I think there's something going on with this guy. All reports to me indicate, and just my, my gut feel, listening to him miss Torrey Pines, listening to him miss the Phoenix Open. Now he, he wants 72 holes on live. Jeff, it sounds like he's got some remorse here. It sounds like he was sold a bill of goods and was completely let down thought he was going to pull a fast one with Hatton and cash in, and then boom, I got access to both tours. Not so fast. Do you think that has any impact on perhaps a letdown this week, knowing that he's playing in a field and, and having dinner tonight with uh, a room, 80% of the pe- people in that room, Jeff? I don't think they're too fond of rum right now. Well, I, I mean, we've seen it with Dustin Johnson, and these guys that have gone over there and gotten the large paydays, and now you can see Rom where – He's been just outside contention, you know, outside of a tournament or two. He hasn't looked like he's going to win. He hasn't got a, a win live or a live win yet. And there's complacency that can set in when you get that guaranteed check. It almost feels like that's where he's at right now. You know, although there are some handicappers out there that have given him out this week, and I really respect these guys. And they between the 12 and 14 to one range. I just have a hesitancy to to back golfers either that have won the week before or that have won the tournament the year before so i'm not looking for the defending champion for, for first like a lot of the times that price is built in mm-hmm. that they had won and we did open him at the eight to nine to one range because he had won there last year now he's tripped it up a bit reached as high as 14 and that's where some of these guys have been buying in at but um it looks like there's almost some complacency that settled in with him over the last few months just being on a live tour knowing what he's got in front of him. I took a flyer on the 72 hole as far as the fade on Rom goes, and that's about it with, with Rory and with, uh, with Xander Schauffele as well. And I do see some local Hideki at plus money. Interesting to me as well. Speaking of a player or a group that you respect, is there a, a golfer out there that you all took interest in fading? I see big money against Wyndham Clark. I see negative commentary about Victor Hovland. I see Min Woo busted his finger. Anybody stand out there? Yeah, I mean, all of those, you know, it's uh, Wyndham Clark, you know, last week in Texas dealt with the shoulder or back issue that, you know, he he thought he might not play and he played through it and didn't really uh, contend. And that factors into people fading him a little bit. Like you mentioned uh, with Min Woo Lee, you know, a broken finger, uh, not to mention the flu. He's got the flu on Monday, didn't even practice. So he's got a couple things going against him there. And before even knowing that information today, I did play Siwoo Kim against Minwoo Lee just because I'm high on Siwoo Kim. Uh, so I laid a dollar thirty in that matchup. Um, but we've taken some sharp money against Sam Burns in a couple matchups too. So I know there's some guys out there that I respect that are, are looking to fade Sam Burns in matchups. Are you a buyer that Burns and Scheffler with them renting a house together and both of their wives you know, being due quite soon could happen any time? Uh, are you a buyer that, let's say, Burns is up three on Sunday, Scheffler is up three on Sunday, and if they get the phone call, do you buy that they're going to bolt? I do. Well, I, is, I, I read it's, it would be Scheffler's first child. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure about Burns. if it is, if, But, yeah, I would expect I would have bolted from anything, and I'm not obviously not in a position that they would be for a career changer like that. But, uh, you know, they've made their money. They've gotten their wins. Uh, and, 
you know, that's such a, a unique thing for, from a personal perspective that it wouldn't surprise me. When I was reading through it today, it said that Scheffler's wife is due at the, towards the end of April. So I guess if that were to happen, the baby would be coming early. So, you know, hopefully you can avoid that scenario altogether. I'm not sure about Burns, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if they did. And, you know, it's uh, one of the things that I equated it to, and it's a little different, but a player having to leave was, at the memorial when rom got tested for covid when he had the why you know he was on his way to a victory not by his choice but you know he had to get taken out of the tournament ended up not winning the tournament and, you know i can't remember the last time um it's funny because uh going back years like ross fisher you know some some of the guys in the office call him uh you know baby golfer because he did a scenario like that many years ago that's going back the, yeah i don't know if it was in the open championship or what but he went through something like that. So uh, it's a unique thing and it's a decision you have to make, but you know, I understand it and it's a personal one. And I, you know, I'd probably do the same thing in that position. Sure. Um, yeah, that's something to factor in again, no better can make a play based on that, but it is nice to have in your back pocket, Jeff, whether it's the, the market wide fade on burns, or if you're somehow, um, you know, taking those five or six bullets on somebody else, not named Scotty Shuffler, I guess with Shuffler nowadays, Jeff, it's, it's really anything you can get to keep this guy out of the picture. Cause you know, if he's there after Thursday, Friday, he's probably not going to let up and he's at least going to make you sweat this thing out on Sunday. I'm totally with you on, uh, on some of these moves here, Jeff, especially that anti Clark. I did it with Neiman. I did him against Aber as well. You as a fellow team Europe supporter, fully aware of the, the, the big picture with this kid. There has been a professional fade leading up to this week. I was on the wrong of that wrong end of that many times, Jeff. I mean, at Riviera, thank you, Justin Thomas. Loser. Pebble Beach, Aubert may as well have won the tournament. He may have if it didn't get rained out. Then I go the other way and play Aubert when he becomes available at plus 130 over Rory. Terrible spot to do so. 0 for 3. Has that professional stance led into this week on an Aubert fade? Because I did, uh, and I was surprised to see that after that play on Neiman, uh, there was actually a better number available soon after. So there must be some Aubert money. There is. I mean, it's, it, it's a tough one here because being a debutante, people like to fade that and you see it. And that's part of Wyndham Clark too, you know, injury debutante fade him from that perspective. His price might be too short. Um, but the same thing with, with Ober. it's, uh, you know, as well as he's been playing, you have people supporting him because of what his play is. And then you have people fading him because of the major moment here that he's facing, you know, first time at Augusta um, might be overwhelming for him. And you're, you're getting some quality golfers that you can get against him. So, you know, I can see it both ways. I'm one that puts more stock on this course into how they play it. Because, like you mentioned, Mickelson out of nowhere, you know, but his great Augusta history, and he thrust up to second place last year. So if you've got the experience here and then the wherewithal at Augusta, that can supersede what your current form is. So I really put more weight into that aspect. And, uh, you know, you can find those golfers in those situations that, that can, uh, you know, handicap it that way. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating discussion with these first timers this year. It does look like Aubert is going to lead the way on your uh, quote unquote uh, uh, debut player category. I think around the neighborhood of three to one, Jeff Clark right behind him at four to one. I would be drifting way down the menu there to take a flyer on a neck road at 11 to 12 range. Or, or do you think there's a high enough ceiling for a, a Ludwig? To, uh, to justify an investment among the first-timers? Uh, I, I wouldn't do it at those short odds. And, you know, that's that's one of the, the uh, markets that Neil had gotten up, so I didn't really delve into that one. But, um, I, you know, I wouldn't take the guys at the top of that. I would look down the list, like you mentioned, some guys in maybe the short uh, double-digit range. And, you know, because I think some of that can be equated out. And I don't think, you know, the odds are basically set on their outright odds. And, you know, being the first-timer, I think they should actually be higher than that. So I think in that market, the guys at the front should be higher. Maybe the guys at the end should be a little bit lower and, you know, maybe find the ones in the middle there that might lie the best competitive advantage for you. Totally with you. I think that, uh, that specific betting option may just come up maybe in a multitude of ways with Ekrod, a guy that can keep everything in front of him, uh, avoid the big miss feeling extremely good about his golf game right now. How about the middle tier on the outright board, Jeff? Somebody that may have came across uh, someone you respect, your personal betting group. I know you take this extremely seriously. How about somebody on that middle tier outright board that led to opportunity as a flyer or maybe that led to opportunity on the matchup market that, that was a popular play for you? 
Yeah, I landed today and coming through all this stuff on Russell Henley, and I didn't play him outright. You know, he's 60 to 80 to one range, but I did bet him for top 20 at plus 165, and I bet him in a couple matchups uh, against Brian Harmon, and I think against Sam Burns was the other one. Uh, so I, I'm on those two, and I wanted to be pro Henley. I think he's going to have a really solid week. You know, two of his last three tournaments, he's finished top four, finished fourth here before. He's got a solid Augusta record. I think he's going to come in with confidence, not be overwhelmed by the moment, and just carry the momentum that he's been doing recently. So um, I'm really strong on him. And also Siwoo Kim. You know, Siwoo Kim's got a respectable Augusta history, but he's coming in in solid form too. And I don't think he has much pressure on him for, from that perspective. So, um, you know, I played him against Min Lee, and like I said, then I found out about Min Lee's issues. So then I went in and played some more on it. And, uh, you know, those are two guys in the 60 to 81 range I can recommend for maybe top 20s, top 10s, matchups. Uh, tough to break through with a win. It's usually these guys at Augusta that, you know, out, outside the rare circumstance, uh, you know, guys 30 to 1 or less are usually the guys that you see cashing the tickets. So um, I stayed away from the outright, but I definitely got involved with him for the, uh, the derivative markets. No doubt. You don't have to tell me. That has not been a, a profitable endeavor my way either, but it's always nice to get one. Um, not named, you know, a Scotty Shuffler on the short odds. Hey, how about Rory McIlroy real quick, Jeff? I know I already touched on him, but you used a big word there, and that's overwhelmed. He's got to be starting to feel in that now. He felt it last year with the missed cut, but I was I was generally surprised last week with his performance. The iron game obviously got fixed, managing the golf course much better. He comes out to our neck of the woods and pays a visit to Butch Harmon, and there he goes on Sunday. Ho-hum 66, wins the tournament, um, if not for Batia and McCarthy, what a finish that was. But I know the market's quite tight on Rory right now, Jeff. Is, is the lack of handle and liability as a whole showing that? Or is there some is there some action pro or anti-Rory? No, we've gotten Rory support. You know, we usually do when he gets out in the double digits, and we've seen it at 12-1. to 1. My only take on Rory is, usually out of the four rounds, he'll have one round that re- is really frustrating as, as a supporter uh, when you've got your money supporting him. And... You know, you just see it where he's in position after day one or two, and you expect him with his quality to go forward and at least hang, and he might take a couple steps backward. And Rory is always the call for that when he's, you know, a little bit out of contention, will have that Sunday charge and end up finishing top five or ten. And then you look through the numbers and say, man, he's been playing so well, but without actually a real shot at winning the tournament. It's coming from behind and finishing strong, things like that. But there's always one round out of the four that really uh, is a hiccup to him. And it's hard for me to get behind him based on that. So I haven't really supported McElroy in an outright market probably in about a year and a half or so. And I'm really hesitant to do so. And like you mentioned, you coming into Augusta now, and it's been so many tries that he's had to, cre- to, uh, to finish off the career grand slam. I think that might be weighing on him a little mm-hmm. bit too. Has to be. I, I know he's got some wonderful golf left in him, but you do have to wonder if the best is out of him. Um, speaking of that, Jeff, I've been looking for a reason to back him. Don't get me wrong, but do you think him failing to quote unquote flame out has led to the the you know basically no opportunity to back? Well, the one thing you have to take into account is a lot of the golf odds these days are originate you know. Monday morning in the European market and Rory McIlroy seems to be the Europeans baby where they have him low and you might find a better price over here in the States than you would over there. They probably get a ton of support on him over some of the other, over Scheffler or over, even over Rom at the top of the market. But his odds always feel week in and week out shorter than what they should be to me. And they, they really don't, you know, like you mentioned, even if he's off a little bit, they don't go out and drift out too far. So um, it's, it's a pretty constant right now. And as long as he keeps coming from behind on Sunday and finishing top five or 10, I don't think you're going to see too much movement on it. Totally with you. You know who my European horse is, Jeff. It's Shane Lowry. Now, I know you're not a Lowry guy. Um, and granted, the guy doesn't have a PGA Tour sanctioned win since the Open Championship. So um, I guess I'm not on the complete right side of that as far as the outright market goes. When it comes to Lowry, Jeff, what did it take for you to dip him down from 60 to 40? You were one of the last remaining books to offer 60, and then I see it plummet to 40. Was that a, a move based on the market or, or a specific play that came in on the big fella? It was an accumulation of play, and it was also a market reaction because uh, it did take a dip on Monday. 
But you go back and look, and he's been having a solid year. Uh, you know, he's, he's got a third and a fourth. Yeah, and, and even at Augusta the last few years, 16th and third. So, um, you know, the numbers are showing for him. And at those type of odds, I can see why. But it was more of a market reaction that caused us. And, you know, in in one of our jurisdictions, we're really well set on him and don't have much support. And some of our other jurisdictions, we've seen the support show up when he was 60 and 50. So, you know, just went with the, the market reaction or else if I left him at 60, it, it would come quickly and uh, we'd probably be in a position where we wouldn't be beneficial on him. Plus money against Fairway Jesus and up to plus 130 against Fitzpatrick. Fair or foul for Lowry? Uh, well, I, I don't, I, I tend, like you said, I'm not really a Lowry supporter, so I tend to not support him in matchups, so it would be just a, a pass for me. Fair enough. Did, it, did you at least lighten up to him a little bit, and then he made Team Europe and ultimately got you home on that 2-1? to one? <laughs> how, do you, how do you not, Jeff? I don't, he, he was about to take Lakava's head off in that parking lot. How do you not like that? No, I, I love the guy. It's just, over the years of doing this, I... Like his numbers to me have been overrated, and I know he won the Open Championship. But even looking ahead to this year's Open Championship and looking at him in the thirty-five to one range, I think that's short, and I think he should be, you know, near fifty to one in that range of golfers. So um, I just I think that he's just too short of odds when he tees it up, and um, I don't see over here in Las Vegas the type of betting support that uh, they see in other markets. So I just. Uh, you might find that difference here. And sometimes if you're looking for Lowry, you might be able to find a, a better price here with us. I totally agree that I did, that several other people did. Hey, look, I'm a big Lowry guy, big soft spot for him. Even I had to draw the line somewhere. Uh, if that name pops up later in this program, certainly can't get below 50. But there is a, I know DraftKings just made it back to 60. So, and there you are back at 50. So I think there's some opportunity there on top of uh, plenty of the names you mentioned. Wonderful work, Jeff. Really appreciate the time. Uh, I know it's extremely busy for you this week, so this means a great deal, my man. Hey, thanks for having me on, and uh, enjoy it. And off goes the great Jeff Sherman. What a spot that was. What tremendous market insight, professional betting insight from Jeff Sherman, who's been a friend of this program for quite some time, not just this program, but dating back to the Sports Talk Radio days in Toledo and, and through Monroe, Michigan, and here we are in Vegas. Jeff's still supporting what we got going, which means a ton to me should mean a ton to the Bet the Board fan. It should mean a ton to the Right Edge, the Golf Odd Show fan out there. Still plenty more to do coming back. We have a massive pick segment. We got everything from Sherman. Let's give you what I got now. There's still plenty of numbers available that I would certainly recommend upon taking advantage of those, whether it was earlier this week, throughout the weekend, or, or building that portfolio up. Not quite as early as Jeff. I don't have any Neiman 50s or 60s, but a couple outrights, a couple matchup plays, we got a FanDuel player, too. And for you bet the board nuts, don't you worry. We have the best bet coming right up after this. Off and running on Right Edge, the Golf Odd Show, and as well as on our debut here on the Bet the Board Podcast Network. Big thanks to Jeff Sherman again. Tons of takeaways from that spot. I have to cover one of them before we make it official on the pick segment concluded by the official best bet for you bet the board nuts out there. It has to start the conversation that is with, with Xander Schauffele. I cannot recommend a play at 13 or 14 on Schauffele, bottoming out at 1250. Can't do it. Not at this time. That is why you have live betting. See how this weather plays out. I do believe he can get through it. I do believe when this course, not if, but when, this course would to firm up through the weekend, Shawfle is going to possess the confidence. He's going to possess the go- uh, the ball flight. He has the recent form. He has a T2 to his name at the Masters, albeit five years ago. Not going to give out that outright price, but I'm letting you know right now I'm, b- I'm a believer in that move. I got in late at 19. That was at Boyd. In a matter of minutes, the entire market was sub-15, so I, I still feel like it's a decent buy despite missing out on... Uh, on DraftKings 28, 10 to 14 days ago, on the 25s last week. Still a 22 hanging, didn't grab it. I got the 19. I can't go below that, let alone 13. But when it comes to the matchup opportunities, as Jeff explained, the one that stands out to me is going to be over Rom, as well as an opportunity to cash in on the, on the small VIG for the top 20. 
and then you pay attention to the outright price. Let's see where things are at after round one. Let's see they're, where they're at after round two. Not much has to be set back in order to, to meet that 19 to 20 to one. And at a golf course like this, that would be a player I'm, I'm going to be watching. In fact, I'm going to be watching for the opportunity to hit him again. So we're not going to make that official on our pick segment because I just can't do it. I can't recommend the number. I can't can't have that number attached to the portfolio. But what I can share with you is that he was a part of the fade on Rom. Xander, that is. They're neck and neck on the tee sheet. He and Rory, I believe you can make an argument, deserve to be in, in the minus 115 to minus 125 range against the defending champ. Yes, much of it is subjective. While the form has been good, I'm still not a buyer into this live golf and to for, for this to be legitimized in any way. Um, okay, if it's Kepka, he has five major championships. I know Rom could end up there as well. But when it comes to four top tens and five starts on live, this is a different ball game. John Rom's putting hasn't been great this year. It wasn't great last year. Let's see if he can keep up again. The only players I'm using the fade Rom with are big time horses. McElroy, and in this case, Xander Schauffele. Xander Schauffele, that market dip on the outright board, I concur with that heavily, and that move was quite sharp. Now, let's make this official and make our way to the picks. Three outright picks to start, two matchups or props. I got the fan duel play. I got the best bet. Outright pick number one. This market has shrunk as well on top of Schauffele. Not quite to the degree. It's Hideki Matsuyama at 20 to 1 or better. Yes, it's gotten a 16 at Superbook. That's Sherman Shop. Yes, it's gotten sub 20 at Circa, but DK is offering the 20. Several Offshore is offering the 20. Couple Local. Win offering the 20. South Point offering the 20. For now, at least. That is Hideki Matsuyama, a complete under the radar favorite who's absolutely still worth a look after shrinking from 29, 30, and 32, which was still available after that win at Riv, which was noteworthy. I think Riv is a perfect comp for Augusta when you're talking about the importance of of winning, going into Augusta, showing good form, going into Augusta. And it just so happens to be at a golf course where hitting fairways is a must, having a legit short game is a must. That's where Hideki Matsuyama don't look now, but ranks first on tour and around the green. Last year's most improved player, it was Hovland. This year's most improved player, so far at least, it's Matsuyama. The sensational season on top of the win at Riv, four top 12 cents. He knows every bounce of Augusta National. This is his 13th start after all. Second in overall scrambling. Second in overall bogey avoidance for Hideki since 2015. That's at Augusta and Augusta only. Fourth in tee to green last year, on his way to another top 20. Third, T to green last week on his way to a top 10 at the Valero. The putter's a concern. It's a concern when you're talking about winning big pitcher for Hideki. The overall putting must improve. I actually think at a place that's going to intimidate much of the field, Hideki's comfort level is is just a new one at that ever since winning here. That concern limits itself because we're back where Deki has success. I believe he's live again. I believe he deserves to be with Shoffley in that move to the mid to low teens. Because 20 to 1 still out there, I think this is absolutely a play. I think this high decky Matsuyama could get fitted for a second green jacket at 20 to 1 or better. Outright pick number two. I'm going to take Jeff Sherman's advice here. In fact, I've I've taken it in a multitude of ways. But as far as the outright pick here, I'm going to go back to Neiman. Now that I see 30 resurface at FanDuel. DraftKings, Circa's at 3150. Rivers offering 28. I would still play that. It was the 22s and the 23s that that shook me off of Neiman a little bit. Um, on the outright market, at least. I've been high on him on the matchup market. Stay tuned for that. But but let's take Sherman's advice and go with the 25-year-old Chilean who loves Augusta National. He's getting better and better every year. T16 last year. He is making his fifth start. Three worldwide wins. Four months. That's Joaquin Neiman. I don't put much into the live. I put something into the separation he caused for a short time, as well as the Australian Open win. 
as well as the performances on the DP World Tour. I believe he deserves this invitation. I think he's been motivated to prove that he deserves this motiva- uh, invitation. And when it comes to Neiman, I know the 60s are gone. I know the 50s are gone. Uh, but when you're talking about Kepka in that 20 to 1 range, who I respect greatly, I think Neiman deserves to be right there. Hence why I was ready to draw the line there. But because there's 30s, now all of a sudden, all over the place, uh, this is a guy, as Jeff Sherman said, to consider. Let's not forget Neiman has a win at Riviera as well. Let's not forget Neiman has the low two way ball flight on auto command. I think this is a guy guy that could potentially play in weather. I'm looking for that. This is a guy that can play in high winds. I'm looking for that. This is a guy with course success, course reps. I got it all here with Neiman at 30 or better, and I think those boxes check off. Let's go with Neiman, and let's grade this at 30 to 1. Yeah, I'm going to conclude with Shane Lowry here at 50 to 1, the big fella. 50 to 1 or better, I might add, because DraftKings just went to 60. But let's go back to the big fella here, as we've done many times on this podcast. He's as motivated as ever right now. Lowry is extremely hungry to get a second major championship. I think it bothers him deep down inside that he hasn't been able to get over the hump in Florida where he's played so well at so many difficult golf courses for so long, and he did it again this spring. And I've actually seen some improvements this spring in Florida that I needed to see last year before buying stock into what was a really rock solid, once again, performance at Augusta National. Top 25 in his last three. Only three players have done that. Lowry's one of them. He's changed his routine. He got there a week early and is now going to be walking around with a lot of wedges and a lot of putters this week. I like that for Lowry. This is a guy that can hang with the top of the crop when it comes to the iron game. This is a guy that can hang with the fairway finding percentage. In fact, he rakes second on tour this year. He rakes third in overall approach to the green. Fabulous iron player. Maybe the best in the world, not named Scotty Scheffler or Joaquin Neiman when it comes to overall ball striking over the course of this season. Top 20 par 4 player, Lowry. Top 20 par 5 player, Lowry. Putting much better than it was last year. Terrific lag putter on these greens. The three-putt avoidance has not been there, nearly 150th on tour. But when it comes to Augusta National, when it comes to Lowry's last three starts, when it comes to his dedication to mastering this golf course, 50 to 1 or better on the big fella. We've been waiting for this. What a time it would be. I'm avoiding the matchup versus Fairway Jesus. I am avoiding the matchup versus Matt Fitzpatrick out of respect to those players. The plus money was attractive, especially against Fitzpatrick climbing up to, I'm seeing plus 25s, I'm seeing plus 30s now. I'm going to avoid all that and stick with the outright market for the big fella here, as well as a local play fading Morikawa at plus 106. This is the headliner, Shane Lowry. This is the number, 50 to 1. This is the time for the big fella. Let's move on to a couple matchups here albeit a couple that we're going to be laying a number, but they're matchups that I still like at this number, although they've been on the move uh, because I just, I view them as a couple of mismatches. It starts with a player that was mentioned with the great Sherman, and that's Austin Eckrote, who is available over Jake Knapp at one, two, three, four, five, six. I got seven books in front of me, the most notable of which being MGM. I'm not going to use William Hill Caesars because that thing is ballooned to a peak of minus 80. This was played at minus 125 and minus 130. I'm seeing 40s and 45 out there. I'll be fair here and great at 45 and just simply say stay off of William Hill and Caesars. That's Austin Eckrote minus 145 over Jake Knapp. I think this is a total mismatch. You have to go with the player in better current form here. Knapp has come back to earth. T57, T45 in a miscut where we were on him a couple of weeks ago with the winner of the tournament in Jaeger. And it just seems like since that win, Jake Knapp has not been priced properly. That includes on FanDuel a couple weeks ago against Jaeger. Jaeger being minus 120 was was almost laughable. Yes, they're both first-timers. Yes, this arena is going to be big for both. I happen to believe that this is going to be bigger for Knapp. Akro keeps it in front of him. He avoids the big miss. 
there is a large discrepancy between the two in that category. Eck wrote, 19th on tour in distance from the edge of the fairway, which measures the big miss. Knapp, 127th on tour. That is key. Eck wrote, he is a player that can go toe-to-toe with Knapp in the long iron game. Knapp has shown steadiness in that category, top 50 and 150 to 200 overall. Eck wrote just happens to be top 30. So he clips Knapp there. I think he can clip him with the with the putting. Eckroat's putting stroke is built to lag it properly on these greens. Eckroat has familiarity with these type of greens in this geographical area. I don't love the number. I still think it's a play. I think the weather, I think the wind is going to have a much greater effect on Nap's ball flight than it does Eckroat. More of a one-way, first time at Augusta for both again. I just do not like this spot for Nap. At all. When it comes to Eckroat, higher on him as a top debut player. I'm with Sherman here as well. I can't lay three to one with Aber for the top debut. I certainly can't lay it with Clark at four to one. I'm moving down that list if I were to get involved there or in another way if this matchup is not available to you. As a top debut player, that could be Austin Eckroat in that 11, 11 and a half to one range, FanDuel, DraftKings, Superbook, etc. That is is something to consider. Jeff Sherman elected to use Austin Eckroat with Luke Liss. That has been hit by professional money. There seems to be a group or two out there this week and and mainly leading up to this week, Austin Eckroat money. Let's take that into our pick segment and grade this at minus 145 to be nice. I would play this up to minus 145. Bet online, South Point, MGM, stay off of William Hill Caesars. That is the fairway finding machine, Austin Eckroat. Let's go on to our second matchup, and it's another one where we're laying a number. It's another one that we got in the minus 125, minus 128, minus 130 range that it's on the move now. I project it to be on the move again. So I'm willing to hand out Gary Woodland here at minus 135 over Bubba Watson. MGM still there, wins at minus 40. Locally, I'd play it. South points at 40, I'd play it. Bet online, hang in minus 132. You must get on that. I do not expect that to be there, uh, leading it into the first wave of tee times. I just don't. Uh, this is another matchup here. I don't think Bubba Watson has any business being priced uh, with Woodland here. This is not the same Gary Woodland as a year ago. And by the way, Gary Woodland, when he was overcoming some serious issues, and thank goodness he's healthy now, and he looks healthy, and this is a rock-solid guy, so thank goodness everything's working out for Woodland. He was able to continue his career after the brain surgery. T14 last year at the Masters. T21 last week. The T to green game never really left. The ball striking and the putter is what disappeared. The ball striking has been addressed by no other than Butch Harmon, same gentleman that Rory McIlroy has been working with to get back on track leading into the Masters. The driving efficiency is there. The reports out of the Woodland camp is that he's been going quite hard at correcting the putting issues. He's going back to a place where I think he has a, a quite a nice feel for the greens at Augusta. Positive strokes gained in three of the four rounds last year, 18th overall in putting in the 2023 Masters. That's, that's not Gary Woodland-like, but if you can get the hot putter in his hand, you're talking about a top 20 player. And if I'm sorry, if you're giving Woodland anywhere near a top 20 this week, he's going to end up blowing away Bubba Watson. That's a matchup that can easily cash on Friday if they get the golf in. A player in Woodland that ranked second in tee to green in Houston just a couple of weeks ago. Number one in approach in Houston just a couple of weeks ago. Folks, the, the secret's out. Gary Woodland is back, and and Bubba Watson just is not. Outside the top 50 in every single category last year, well on his way to a missed cut, and Bubba Watson has not been playing more golf since. Bubba Watson has not corrected much since. In fact, I think he has his heart set more so on an ambassador and managerial role with Live Golf. He's, He's not playing anywhere near the type of form that he expects to, and and he's starting to realize that. The bookmakers, on the other hand here, Did not give me the guy that just picked up 8.8 strokes in Houston on approach versus a total has been in Bubba Watson. And frankly, I'm not totally sure where the cap this off because this could get to any point tomorrow. 
let's call this Gary Woodland over Bubba Watson up to minus 150. I think this is Gary Woodland and a runaway. Let's move along and get you an update on our fan duel market here, which somehow the matchup menu on the 72 hole has not been released at the time of this recording, Tuesday night. Uh, but I'll let that go because we do have some things to chew on here. I thought about Mickelson on the group play as the top senior. Mike Weir is the only guy in that group that I can see Mikkel- giving Mickelson a fit there. Uh, we did lay minus 125. I would not go there at minus 150. I just don't have the overall trust in Phil this year. That is a line, though, to watch. Sherman said he would price that around the 150. That's kind of my territory to take a pass. It, there's been some fluctuation. That's a play to keep an eye on. Neiman, as a top South American, it's, it's a group of three play. It's with Vijegas, who's pinned at 8-1, to one, and it's with Grio. I think Neiman runs over both of those guys. I don't think Vijegas is any match for this golf course. We're going to find that out. And Grio, that is a guy that probably needs it to play firm in the fairway and, and not still firm on the greens. He could be set back. Uh, could Grio? I don't love the fit there. Respect Grio as a player. Certainly, I, I think there's going to be some spots that we get behind him this year. But I will point out that the Neiman price is north of two dollars. But I will also point out that minus two ten, minus two fifteen on DraftKings was hit, and I followed up with with a play on the minus two twenty five. That's what I think about the separation between Neiman at Augusta National with a handful of starts under his belt and going up against Grio and Vijegas. That's number two with FanDuel. As far as an official play to grade, I'm comfortable handing out Tiger Woods to miss the cut. It did open minus 118 at FanDuel. This is now up to minus 160 to miss the cut at Superbook. Your best other options aside from FanDuel appear to be Bet Rivers and just about Bet Rivers only, unless you got everything loaded up on the offshore front. I think minus 140 for Tiger Woods to miss this cut presents some value. I think over 74 and a half round one score at minus 110 presents some value after Sherman handed that out on our spot. Between the potential effect that this weather could have on his game, how about the late early tee time, which is going to provide him shorter time to recover? I, I think the Masters tried to do him a favor here. Uh, Augusta tried to do him a favor here with the with the expected weather, but what are you going to do? It's it's a bit of a crapshoot now, and and what you did guarantee him is shorter time to recover. This is a guy that has completed three 72-hole tournaments in four years. I've never been to the Masters, but I do know that TV doesn't do it justice. It doesn't give you even an idea of what the true physical toll it can have on a player right now with Tiger Woods. Now, the ankle might be fine compared to last year. It's not going to be swollen. It could be relatively pain-free. But that's not the issue here. The issue is it's leading to other problems in his body. His body's starting to work a different way. That is far from comforting. So while it's not the ankle specifically, there are other issues developing with Tiger Woods. You add in the weather. You add in the short rest from Thursday to Friday. You add in just the fact, just the possibility that he could be playing 20 to 25 holes in one day even if that doesn't occur, I'm still confident this gets home. I'm confident in the price adjustment at the Superbook. Minus 140. Again, not a fun price to lay, but I think you have to do it here on FanDuel. I think you have to lay the juice with Tiger to miss the cut. I think you have to accept the market move on the over 74 and a half round one, minus 110, and go. And that is on FanDuel. And finally, The moment we've all been waiting for. Yes, we have narrowed it down. Yes, we have a best bet for the Bet the Board listenership. And let's attack an angle that was brought up in our conversation with Jeff. Jeff mentioned his position on Joaquin Neiman, whether it's his past portfolio investments or the recommendation to to get involved as we inserted into our, our outright section on the pick segment. What was also mentioned was the money against Wendell Clark. I'm talking Hideki Matsuyama up to minus 175, minus 170 at Superbook. I'm talking heavy money on Wako Neiman. Let's use Wako Neiman, albeit after a small price jump, up to minus 125 
over Wyndham Clark. Again, this is the fifth appearance for Neiman. None for Clark. Wyndham Clark, just trying to navigate his way around the place. Has no idea what he's in for, for the one-way left-to-right ball flight at a place he's never been. I think hole number two, I think hole number 10, I think hole 13, I think hole 14 can cause serious problems for Wendell Clark. It takes far more than a couple of practice rounds and a couple of visits on this side of the calendar year to get accustomed to those lies, to get accustomed to not having a single, what it feels like, not one single level lie shot all, all week at Augusta. I think Clark's going to find that out the hard way this week versus a player in Neiman who has all the shots, who is a better win player, and the course familiarity, the course knowledge, and the course history entirely has me thinking this match should be in the minus 140, minus 150 range. Add in that Clark had the back issue. Now, it didn't quite show. He did fire Sunday 66 that same week. Almost burned us against the Gala. Thank you for the missed seven-footer on 17. Thank you for the par on 18. One-shot win, the Gala. I'm looking for far greater than a one-shot win this week with Neiman over Clark. This is a professional fade that I'm totally on board with, and this is a price that I'm still willing to lay. Offshore, South Point locally, win locally. Superbook is about where I would cap it off. Sherman's on top of it, minus a buck 35. Well, Nick, you just keep giving us juice plays. How's that going to lead to profit? Secondly, I mentioned I played Waco Neiman over Ludwig Aubert, another first-timer. That price, to my surprise, went in the opposite direction. While I expected to level it out at minus 110, I see some even monies here. Let's call Neiman minus 110 over Ludwig Aubert a second play for our best bet. Neiman, two ways, once over Clark, another way over Aubert. I don't as much question Aubert and the T to green ability here. I think he's one of the very few guys that can still bust out an iron often on, on the tee here. What does concern me is the putting. The three-putt avoidance, the putting from inside five feet on greens that are going to be stimped out at 14, 14 and a half. The fact that the big miss came into play a little bit on Sunday isn't too comforting. If you're an odd bear backer, again, I wouldn't read too much into that, but it did come into play, and he did not have a good Sunday. Nearly lost two shots, gained approach to the field on Sunday, did Aber. And again, if the putting doesn't get home, then then I, I think he could be in danger of making this cut. And you are going against the same Waco Neiman that is ready to roll and ultimately contend on this stage. Waco Neiman just appears to be a better fit for me to get home over 72 holes than Ludwig Aber. That price and that direction on the market surprised me. Let's call this a double-barreled attack on Waco Neiman via the 72-hole matchups for our official best bets. Plural. Waco Neiman, a buck 30 over Wyndham Clark. And Waco Neiman, minus a buck 10 over Ludwig Aubert. Those are your best bets. That is is your master's edition of Right Edge, the Golf Odd Show coming your way on the Bet the Board podcast network. What a show. What a spot with Jeff. What a life ahead here with the 88th edition of the Masters. Nick Swatala signing off on a Masters Tuesday edition of Right Edge, the Golf Odd Show. Folks, we've won the market battle. Now, let's go win the war. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T O D D F U H R M A N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P A Y N E I N S I D E R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery. YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.